texture to the San Marzano tomato. Chef just lightly sautés a little bit of virgin olive oil, seasons it with a little bit of garlic, some herbs and some spices, just gently cooks the San Marzano tomatoes to bring out their natural sweetness and flavor while preserving their integrity. It's tossed with one of our handmade artisan pastas and finished with fresh chopped basil. So it really showcases the extreme sweetness and flavor of the San Marzano tomato. The next sauce is the Arbiata sauce. If you ask the ladies in the kitchen, you know, I've cooked, like I, I remember making Arbiata sauce 35 years ago when I was working at an Italian restaurant. And we just always knew it was like a spicy sauce. The literal translation of Arbiata, yeah, angry. It's like an angry sauce. When you ask like Angelina back in the kitchen, like, what is Arbiata? She's like, I don't know, it doesn't make sense. She's like, it's, the sauce is just angry. <laughs> so I would describe it as also a wonderful way if you like a little bit of spice. But it's a nice balance because you have the sweet tomatoes. Sweet and spice are great flavor pairing that play off of each other very well. So the same thing, chef focuses on the San Marzano tomato in this specific sauce. It stands at the forefront just by sauteing a little bit of olive oil with garlic, herbs, and spices. They'll add a little bit of dried crushed chili to it. Instead of, oh, it's tomato basil with hot seed. We understand the difference? If I can get every one of you to talk like that, our business will go up 20%, and you're going to make 20% more. Because that's how they talk in Vegas. That's how I've trained them to talk at Joe Muir Bloomfield. Yes. A little spicy, right? That's good, though. Don't drink the water, it intensifies it. That is delicious. It's my favorite so far. That's great. You just said milk. Because what combats heat? Fat is number one. Sweet is number two. So that's, I'm sorry. Is Arbiata vegan, too? Yes. They're both vegan sauces. When you toss it with a pasta that's made with egg, obviously that kind of nullifies that. But we do have pastas that are. <coughs> so now I'm following up that spicy sauce with fat. You're welcome. To help calm your palate. Mornay sauce. Or in Italian they would say basciamella. A thickened white sauce. So as you're tasting that sauce, what does it taste like? Cream. Cream. Tastes like cream. Is it great? No, it's not supposed to be great. Here's why. Here's what that sauce does. And because you guys are very astute and you've been with me for a while in Clarkson, you're going to notice. When I first came to the company, when Aldo owned his Italian restaurant and he wanted to make fettuccine alfredo, fettuccine alfredo is a pretty simple sauce. Cream, butter, garlic, parmesan, salt and pepper, and if you're feeling fancy, add a little parsley to it. <laughs> it's like cooking in the 70s. When I was a chef, you know, even the late 70s and early 80s, I wasn't a chef, I was a cook. I don't even know if I'm a chef today, who cares? The title means nothing to me. Look at my jacket, I'm going to have a name on it. I just want to work, you know? I love when I go to conventions and I go to tastings and I go to trade shows and these guys walk in with these pants and... They look like race car drivers with all this shit and blazing all over them. And, like they can't even walk straight because they got like metals hanging around their neck. Like, what are you trying to impress? <laughs> you know, let's go outside. I'll fight you. <laughs> and then after that, let's do a mystery basket. That's what I do too, trust me. I just wear mine on the inside. But, um,. The Mornay sauce was designed so Alfredo, Chef Aldo's take on the Alfredo to make it a little bit lighter, a little bit more palatable. I mean, that's what happens. When you need something that's fatty and rich, you dive into it and you're like, wow, that was great. The law of diminishing returns, right? Bite three is not as good as bite one. Bite five is worse than bite three. By the time you get to bite seven, it's like you push the plate away, you can't eat it anymore. It's too much. It's too much, right? So his take on it was I'm going to use a little bit of either chicken broth or a vegetable broth or a stock to lighten it up a little bit so that you can actually enjoy and eat more of it. It makes great sense. It's a, it's a smart way to do it. So his was very similar, but it had 
you know, 20% chicken broth in it. Protein, it's healthier, cuts down the fat, cuts down the calories, adds another depth of flavor to it. So that's how we've made it here for years. But the challenge always was, if you've been with us for a long time, some of you that are some veterans like me, that's how we used to make an Alfredo. The chef would get an order, he'd put the cream in the pan, the chicken stock in the pan, the butter in the pan, the mascarpone cheese, the Parmesan, the salt, the pepper, and it would put it on the stove and he'd cook it. And two and a half minutes later, roughly, it would be cooked down, reduced, thickened, and the perfect consistency. He'd make sure it was seasoned properly, add the handmade fettuccine to it, toss it, spin it, and sell it. Well, guess what? We get busy. Now it only simmers for a minute and a half because he's busy and he hurries it and then he sells it and then it comes up in the window and you go to pull it out of the window and it's thin and soupy and it splashes all over you. The next one he's busy and he turns his back and it cooks for three and a half minutes instead of two and a half minutes. Now it's like glue. He's too busy, he just throws the noodles in there and puts it up and now the noodles are standing up this tall on the plate. They put their fork in it and the fork stands up. Are you right? We've seen it? <laughs> So this was my way to combat that, and this is classical French cooking, where we have base sauces that you make and you create to make sure that everything then that's derived from that sauce is much more consistent. So this is exactly what you would do, this is cream. But this is cream that I've already took, cream, butter, garlic, herbs, spices, a little bit of chicken broth, and I've already cooked it and simmered it all together thickened it, reduced it, and made sure that now it's the perfect base. So now when I get an order for Alfredo, it goes in the pan, the chef has to add just a little bit more broth to it, a little bit of Parmesan cheese, let it cook for 30 seconds, and now the Alfredo is done. But this is just the base sauce to the Alfredo. So when you go to the window and you're waiting to pick up your fettuccine Alfredo in Clarkston, and you see the chef take a ladle right out of the well and put it over the top of your pasta, that's wrong. That's not Alfredo sauce. That's why I wanted you to taste it today. This is the sauce that we use to make Alfredo. But that's a cheat, that's a shortcut. That's a kid that shouldn't be working on our lines and shouldn't be cooking our food. You understand the difference of where I'm going with this? I'm trying to get a more consistent product, better quality, by saving a step, yes, it adds more prep to it, but that's all right. I want to try to deliver a more consistent quality product coming out of the kitchen. Yeah, I saw someone take uh, Pomodoro sauce and try to give it to me like it was tomato based sauce. It's not the same thing. Huge problem, especially if someone has a dairy allergy. Yeah. Forget about it. Call 911. I can't. I can't eat Pomodoro sauce. Which is, which is a good comment, too, because a lot of you don't know it, too. We have an SOP for allergens. Do any of you know what that is? procedure for allergens and it's very simple you go to your posse you hit table 12 you hit allergy C server and you set the ticket so the chef can hang that ticket in his kitchen table 12 has an allergy to either shellfish or dairy or whatever it might be we had an instance here years ago where someone came in said they had a nut allergy and they were let's just say chicken uh, marsala for example Chicken Marsala, you probably know, comes off the saute station. The server's like, oh, chicken Marsala, there's no nuts in that, no problem. Boom, doesn't tell the chef. Well, chef had on special that night, like walleye, walleye encrusted with pistachios. So the same tongs and the same spatula that he's cooking with, he's using to cook the pistachio walleye. Cross-contaminated it. Major emergency, person got rushed out of here in an ambulance. I want to take the onus off of you and put it on us. All you have to do is alert us to the allergy, boom, now it's the chef's responsibility to deal with it. And I know a lot of your chefs don't feel comfortable in the dining room, but we got to start making that a better habit. I'm trying to work with them. I'm trying to get them in the dining room. You, when you see me working at like Hall Road or whatever, how much time am I in the dining room? Decent amount, you know? I like being in the dining room. I like talking to people. I like helping you carry out your food, helping you stay organized. And I like to just watch what you guys are doing to see where we can make improvements. But the responsibility should come off of you and go on to us. Yes? Uh, on the Alfredo, so what's the procedure again? They make pre-make the sauce, and then so the 
the order? What exactly goes in the pan? So that Bornet sauce goes in the pan, a little bit of chicken broth goes in the pan. We've been using vegetable broth, actually, let me rephrase that. We used to use chicken, and now we switched it to vegetable broth. But the Mornay sauce, the vegetable broth, salt, pepper, Parmesan, it simmers, it boils, done. Cool. The mascarpone is already in there. So I have to try to shorten the process. So for bowls, right, we use vegetable broth? We, okay. yeah. We used to use chicken broth, and then about a year ago, I switched everything to vegetable broth. Just because people would question, well, I'm ordering Alfredo, why is it made with chicken broth? Okay. Well, in my mind, I, I would still like to make it with chicken broth because there's a higher protein content in chicken broth than vegetable broth. And it has a better depth of flavor, let's be honest. You don't taste the chicken, but people sometimes... It's, it's like a fattiness of protein from chicken. Although, Alex, I don't think, I think ours sometimes, you have to still double I'll follow up with all them too my next chef's meeting to make sure that that transition has happened. But we all keep vegetable stock on the line. It's something that I check for when I go to your stores. But in my opinion, like if I was going to make asparagus soup, if I wanted to make like a beautiful asparagus soup, I would want to use chicken broth before I use vegetable broth. It's going to have a richer depth, depth of flavor. But then people are like, oh, well, so I wanted a vegetable asparagus soup. You have a lot more people who are very healthy, like chicken. Right. Okay. So notice I put this on here too. So those of you that aren't Italian, arrabbiata. <laughs> So here's a question that comes up a lot too. Marinara. I don't know really kind of where this came into being, but for some reason a lot of Italian restaurants call it marinara sauce. Marinara in literal translation in my world is marinara would be like Italian for a mariner. Mariner like a fisher. So like in my world, when I see marinara sauce, it means in the style of the fisherman, it would generally be something sort of like a pasta frutta de mare, some sort of a seafood or fish stew or something. But for some reason, Americans think that marinara sauce is tomato basil sauce. What's that? Meatless sauce. Right, or meatless sauce, right. More, more thin consistency, not real chunky. That's what I think of as marinara. Okay. I don't, you know. I don't really know how we combat that, but if you're a, a server and someone says, I want marinara sauce, I would just say, absolutely. There's a lot of different methods of preparation for the marinara sauce. We generally can make ours with or without caramelized onions because I see it both ways. So I would just simply add tomato basil with onion or not with onion, and I wouldn't upcharge the onions. We don't have garlic cloves on it? It's the same as the tomato basil sauce, basically in my mind. The difference when we make marinara is we add oregano to it, as opposed to only basil. So if someone comes down to you and says, I want your marinara sauce, they're going to get tomato basil with oregano, and then they can either have it with caramelized onion or without. Just no dairy. No dairy, still, correct. And everybody loves, like, we think that if we make money by getting the check average up, which I guess, yes, makes sense, but we don't make money by making like dime on our customers. If someone wants marinara sauce and you say, would you like that with caramelized onions or not? Because traditional marinara sauce in my world would have onion in it. I'm not charging them for a side of onion. That's their sauce. It comes with chopped up onion in it in the sauce. Plus, like, the price is set for like, certain like, ounce of onions. So like, if you put like, a pinch of onion in there, right. you're charging for like, an ounce of onion. Yeah, we're not even there. I'd probably, I'd probably add like a half an ounce of onion to that. It's not like I'm adding four ounces like I'm serving on a steak. Yeah, that's why like you want to charge for like when someone gets like a lot of their sauce for their bread, but if they just want to sign their sauce. Right. I think that's a great point. I'm a stickler for people charging. And I know a lot of your chefs are kind of penny pinchers because I'm on their case about their food costs all the time. But there has it's it's every every time is the right circumstance for the right time and the right item. Someone orders a fifty dollar steak and they want a side of zip sauce. If you ever charge them for a side of zip sauce, I would be infuriated. However, if they come in there and they're 
ordering a side of zip sauce because they want to dunk their bread in it, that warrants a charge for zip sauce. I've had a table once that had 12 sides of zip sauce. Yep. It was disgusting. Well, why is that disgusting? People want to come to our restaurant and eat our sauce. It's like bowls and bowls of zip sauce. Just it was like that is my brother. My brother's a vascular surgeon, so I'll give you his card. No, that was the only table. You know, but I, I think also we we spend so much time. I blew up at one of our meetings to one of our managers, and what you know what. We're doing promotions. Like, let's talk about that for a second. I, I'm so sorry. I get off topic all the time. But this is all important learning. This is what we're here for. So we walk out of here better, smarter, more educated, and more in tune with the brand of who we are. That's my goal. So Monday night, what do we run on Monday nights? Be honest. No penalty. Who likes bottomless pasta? I do. Right. The cheapos. Okay. So here's the deal. Why do you think we run bottomless pasta? Educate them what's different from our pasta. Thank you. It is a marketing campaign. It is not a discounted promotion. It is a way to market who we are and that our pasta is made fresh. Our sauces are made fresh from San Marzo. It's a marketing campaign. And it gives you an it's, opportunity left to taste the meatballs and the sausage to add things that they normally would as well. Yes. Because they can add it because they're going to for a cheaper price. A thousand percent. I'm going to allude on that in a second. I get a lot of people on Monday nights who come for the pasta. They already know about it. So we wouldn't have them if we didn't have them. And when, what time do they normally come in? Five. Right. Early. Right. When the whole restaurant's empty. So if I'm a server and I'm in section two, these are my three tables for the night, I'd rather wait on someone that comes in, even if they're drinking water, who cares? Two bottomless pastas, that table would have sat there empty anyway. So hey, you know what? Yeah, they're in, they're out. I made, so what? The bill was 20 bucks, I made five bucks. Five bucks you didn't have. And then you can um, see, see that table later when the dinner reception and it gives us an opportunity to tell our story, gives us an opportunity to promote this. We're not out promoting, hey, we want every cheapo in town to come eat at our restaurant and eat bottomless pasta. It's a way that we can market that we're better, we're different, and we're unique to everybody else. And now we start adding kids eat free. So you guys already don't like the bottomless pasta program. <laughs> so now I'm gonna say kids can come and eat for free. And you know why we decided to do this? Because I want, I, I use your example all the time. I walk through your dining room, a couple Saturdays ago, there was nobody in Sterling Heights dining room that was under 55 years old. There was 100 people in the dining room, every one of them was over 55 years old. He said they're all going to be dead in 10 years. Yeah, they are. I mean, that's a bad example, but like one table, I was like, you better get their food out now. I don't think they're going to make it to dinner. The gentleman fell asleep in his suit the other day. He really wanted that to be <laughs> Food coma, baby. So here's the deal. I mean, we have this. We had a ridiculous amount of homecomers come through, and I just stressed to all my servers that these are the people that we are going to be serving in our future. So when we get those young kids coming in, those millennials, just telling our story is so important because that is what they are looking for. They're looking for craft everything. That's cool. The problem with money is though that you know they eat 70% of their meals without a utensil. Yeah. <laughs> it's a known fact. Millennials eat approximately 70% of all the food that millennials eat, they don't eat with a utensil. Oh. <laughs> Sandwiches, tacos, pizza, nachos, like that's terrible. I am freaking out. I'm like having a hot flash and panic attack. <laughs> Well, you're right. I mean, that's a cool way. If I'm, a, if I'm a senior in high school and I bring my date to home from homecoming to Andiamo and have this great time because... You're going to have your other son of great Right. Friends. Now when I'm 21 and I'm going for my drink and taking my lady out, where do you think I'm going to go? I'm comfortable with Andiamo. I know it. I like it. I mean, you're right. We have to establish We have to establish this relationship with a younger report. So kids eat free. I'm not trying to fill your restaurant so they can turn it into a playground. But I'm trying to make your restaurant a place where younger people are going to come. I live near your location. I live five, five miles away. And everybody that I know, 
I talk. You guys obviously know that, right? What do you think I do when I'm in my neighborhood, at the grocery store, at the party store, at the wherever, at the barber shop, when I'm everywhere, I'm at the auto parts store, my neighbors, I can't cut the grass. They were laughing at me that they said I looked sunburned today. I was outside for like 12 hours at my house yesterday. Because it takes me not long to cut the grass, rake my leaves, and blow up my sprinklers because everybody up and down the street, they see me outside, they're like, oh God, they better run the other way because I'm out there with them for half an hour. And I'm always talking about Andiamo, my job, what I do, but nobody, nobody mentions Andiamo. None of my neighbors, everybody's my age, everybody's in their like late 40s, okay, late 30s. <laughs> late 40s, but nobody thinks that Andiamo is relevant. For some reason, we've missed this generation. They're like my generation is, for me, this is where my mom and dad came. You know, this was like my parents' place. It's not my place. So we're trying to get a younger generation in. And the reason it is, hey, we want to get the 20-year-olds, the 30-year-olds, and the 40-year-olds with young kids coming to our places again. With the thoughts when they bring their kids for Kids Can Eat Free on Monday, maybe they come back for date night on Saturday. Maybe they come back for their anniversary. The whole reason we're doing Kids Eat Free is to market to a new demographic, establish relationships with that demographic, create a relationship, server manager to those people, so that when it is date night, they think of us. When it's their anniversary, they think of us. When the kid graduates kindergarten now, we throw them a party because that's the world that we live in now. They're going to call. They're going to call Vanessa and have the party at Hall Road. When Grandma passes away, unfortunately, it's going to happen. Call Vanessa at Hall Road because we go there. We like it there. We have a familiarity with you. In a time of trouble, we know where we're going to go. In a time of celebration, we know where we want to go. When it's homecoming, where am I going to send my kids? To a place that I know that it's safe. It's all marketing. I don't want to fill your restaurants with kids, but I want to create relationships. So that's what it's all about. Off topic, but when we do these things, understand there's a methodology to it. Olive oil and garlic sauce, we didn't talk about it quickly. I mean, I think we did, we mentioned it. But we don't say it comes with hot seed or crushed red pepper. Chef adds a little bit of dried spiced chili to it. Basil pesto crema, we don't just say, well, it's our Mornay sauce with pesto added to it. <laughs> it's a wonderful blend of rich, sweet cream, 24 month aged Parmigiano Reggiano. Pecorino Romano, chef takes fresh basil, processes it, makes his own pesto here in house, but don't worry, he makes it nut free. Well, I've been telling all the chefs to make it with no pine nuts. So that would be something, someone says they have a nut allergy, boom, you're in contact with the chef and it's his responsibility then. If I can change the way that you describe things, and I use this example all the time, and I won't put Buddy on the spot, but if I went to a, a restaurant and I went to someone and said, explain to me the polyphenol. I'm, but I'm not gonna embarrass Buddy. I'm in the presence of uh, a legendary <laughs> So, when I look at a server that would say, describe to me the polyphenol, I 99 out of 100 servers that are on Yama brand would say, well, it's chicken tenderloins, prosciutto, onions, peas, white wine, and a rosemary cream, and it comes with our spinach and egg pasta. Fair assessment? Yes. That's what's going to happen. I'm just being honest. That's the facts. Well, congratulations. That's what the menu says. So if you're reading the menu, you see polyfiano, it says exactly that. You've already read that. You already know that. So when I say, tell me about it, all you did was just regurgitate what I already read. Still the homemade, homemade pasta egg and spinach. So the, 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 the proper way might be, and again, I'm not a speaker, but the proper way might be, ah, polyphenol, been on our menu since, it's our, since our inception. One of our number one, probably our most popular pasta dish, great choice. I see Chef we start, Aldo. I go into Chef Aldo. There's so many different directions you can go with it, but Chef takes the chicken tenderloins, which are the sweetest, most succulent, most tender part of the entire chicken, 
Those are lightly seasoned. They're caramelized in a skill with a little bit of virgin olive oil. Brings out even more of that natural sweetness. Starts to develop the flavors in the pan. Adds those sweet onions. The onions start caramelizing with the chicken, developing the levels of flavor. As chef caramelizes it, he then adds and deglazes with the white wine. Cooks out the alcohol in the wine. You're just left with that sweet, beautiful varietal of the grape. He's going to finish it with a little bit of chicken broth, some cream, caramelize the prosciutto in there. I mean, you got to go through your whole thing. And it's not just prosciutto. We have uh, prosciutto de Parma. Our prosciutto comes from Parma, Italy. It's aged for 24 months. If you don't know anything about Parma, Italy, Parma is the Mecca, the birthplace of prosciutto. I spent two days in Parma and I ate more prosciutto than most Italians eat in their lifetime. But we have to be let them know that we're proud to feature prosciutto di Parma, aged for 24 months. Because if we don't, then I might as well buy the stuff that they make in Wisconsin and I can buy it for $5.99 a pound instead of $19.99 a pound. So you see the difference? This class is like Andiamo 2.0. Forget what you've learned about the menu. Forget about your training because our training is totally wrong. And that's what we've come to realize. You, you become a new server trainer, what's your test? A, list the five things in a polyfuno. Question two, list the seven things in this dish. Question three, what are the four things in this dish? Who cares, the menu says that. If you come to Joe Muir for dinner tonight, and you look at one of my servers and ask them a question, I don't think they'll say one thing that the menu says. And if they did, it would only be in the last sentence recapping it. They know that their standard operating procedure is to give you minimum of three, better be five bullet points about that dish, what makes it special, what makes it unique, and that's why it's on our menu. And then the sixth or seventh bullet point might just be Finished with 24 months prosciutto di Parma in a light rosemary crema with white wine or something, just to kind of recap what the menu says. But if you come in and say, oh, tell me about your salmon, they're not going to say, well, it comes with an autumn vegetable succotash, saffron risotto, a roasted tomato beurre blanc with lobster essence and parsley oil. That's what the menu says. They're going to say, Salmon, great choice. If you're a salmon lover, highly recommend it. Our salmon is raised in a, a fjord from Loch Duart, comes off the coast of Scotland, iciest, coldest waters in the Atlantic. This salmon has the largest flake of any king salmon. It has an extremely rich, creamy tenderness to it, unparalleled in any other salmon you'll find in the world. I'm sorry, what is our salmon farm raised? Our salmon is aquaculture. Our salmon is raised in a wild environment of 99% water to 1% fish. They have an all-natural diet. They swim in wild environments. Where these pens are follows the natural Gulf Stream, so they're self-filtering. They constantly bring in fresh water, fresh prey. We have it pulled out of the water. It is Jet Express FedEx to us overnight, one day out of the water. They didn't say one thing about what the menu says, but that's how they describe it. That's how they're trained to talk about our salmon. That's how they're trained to talk about every dish on our menu. So when you go back to your stores, you need to practice, you need to role play, you need to challenge each other because you've only got those two people eating bottomless pasta at five o'clock and you got there at 4.45, you have a lot of time between you get busy between 5 and 6 o'clock to talk with other servers and role play. I think it might even have been you. I might have picked you out one time when I was at your store this a while ago, like a year and a half ago after we did a training one day. I'm pretty sure it was you. I remember walking by a table and I think you were describing beef tenderloin to them, like the filet mignon on the menu. And I was so proud of the way that she was talking about it and describing it that I used her as an example in Atlanta talking about the aging out of the meat, the cut of the meat, the grade of the beef that we buy, which we're going to talk about. I mean, hitting on all the bullet points and comfortable doing it. Delivering it without ands, ums, buts, stutters, stammers, with a flow, with consistency, looking them in the eye, making them believe that you know what you're talking about. 
because you have the confidence to do it. And somebody said something earlier too, I think it was uh, he was talking about, uh, I want to get back on that point, I'm sorry, but, but yes, they do come in for $11.99 pasta. Again, it's a marketing, there's a lot of reasons why I do it, and probably one of the other reasons is, yes, it's an opportunity, this whole menu is designed for you to upsell it. For you to get them into a great bottle of wine. That's why we put that wine on your pasta promotion that you're doing right now. So even talking about that promotion that's on the list right now, um, those four pastas that were offered for $16.95, right? How do we like that promotion? Right. 100%. It's designed for you to be knowledgeable about the menu. It's designed for you to be able to upsell it, increase your check. We you put some great wines on there that are extreme value, but high quality. I just bought a case of wine. Anybody drink like uh, French Bordeaux? Anybody like into French Bordeaux? I'm telling you what, if you like French Bordeaux and you taste this, I could tell you I paid $250 a bottle for it and you tasted it, you'd believe it. I paid $25 a bottle for it. It is like the hidden gem from uh, Almedo. It is incredible. So every once in a while you come across these gems and it's 2010, so it's already got a great amount of age on it. It's drinking like it's 12, 15 years old. And it's a great, great wine. So we're offering them some great hidden gems in those wines. So it's a great value. But here's the deal behind that $16.95 pasta promotion that we're offering right now is that um, I would love to just put a commercial on TV, like a side-by-side -side screen, the competition on the other. So follow me here for just a second. Here's our Italian ladies making pasta, all this handmade artisan and stuff, these beautiful San Marzano tomatoes, our chef making the sauce, steam coming out of the kettle, olive oil, garlic, all these herbs and spices and these beautiful tomatoes and everybody's dressed in their pristine uniforms and you know, back there cooking away. And then you show the competition and there they are with like a Ziploc bag of pasta, like <laughs> dumping it into the water. <laughs> right, and their bags are like frozen everything. Here's our band saw, here's our chef like going into his cooler, grabbing all these meats, and he's cutting them all, and they're butchering them all. Here's the competition. Chef's on the line, like, cut the bag open, dumping the meat out. But you can't do that, obviously, right? I mean, how do you, how do you market who we are? How do you get this message across? Buddy said it earlier, like, people know that we're made from scratch, that we make everything, and they don't. They really, truly don't. I just saw a commercial last night for Wendy's and they were putting McDonald's on blast about all oh, their being frozen, they're fresh. And now they're blasting McDonald's of them being fresh, McDonald's being frozen. I was like, right. oh, Wendy's got some balls. They totally put McDonald's on blast. And it was a brand new commercial. So why don't we do that with Oliver? Oh. We're a little different, a little different, uh, a little different segment of the market, I think, with your fast food. I mean, but back in the day, like... Great idea for a commercial that you talked about. That would help a lot of people's eyes. That's why I cook for a living, I don't run the marketing department. Because if I did, here's, I mean, if I ran the marketing department, There'd be a Cadillac Escalade pulling up out front of Andiamo. <laughs> Emma and I would get out of it. I'd take her hand, open the door for her, and I'd walk her into the front door of Andiamo. We'd be sitting down, drinking a beautiful wine, smiling at each other, just having the time of our lives. And then we'd show the competition. You said, what, you hate that? I'd be honored. Oh, well, thank you. I thought she was putting me on blast. But, um, my wife would be with us, of course, too. <laughs> we'd pretend like you're my daughter. I mean, but, uh, then we'd show like this, like hoopty, you know, smashed in like seven different colors, and these people get out that are like, like people that eat like twelve bowls of zip sauce, you know, and they go waddling in like more breadsticks over here, you know, like the bottomless like soup and salad bar. I mean, you watch TV; they're offering three dollar entrees now. I just saw that on TV last night. I was watching the football game. Some commercial came on. Ruby Tuesday. I think they're offering three dollar entrees. If you buy the salad bar. I mean, what kind of world are we living in? There's there's this much in the market that's left that's doing business the way that we do, and the other part of the market is 
Three dollar entrees, five dollar pizzas, and dollar menus. Yes. I studied marketing in college, so I think that like something I've really been emphasized to by my professors is that like you should worry about building your brand and not worry about. Somebody I agree with that. So That's a great point. Brand equity. Your brand equity is the most yeah. important thing. That's, you're a, that's, you sound like you work for our marketing team. But that's what he says. The brand, the brand, the brand, the brand. Watch a Lexus commercial or a Cadillac commercial versus a Ford, Chevy, or GM commercial. I mean, their different marketing is different. You know, it's it's a whole different style of everything about the brand. I mean, it's truly like that. Burger Wars is Burger Wars is a different category. I get it. You're right. So it's all about building our brand. This 1695 is not about trying to fill seats with cheap people, cheapos, sorry, that drink water. It's about our brand. It's about building our brand. And it's the way to market our brand and build our brand by letting everybody know we make everything fresh, we make it from scratch, we know what we're doing, we know what we're talking about. That's why it says in your menu, ah, oh, this is from the Lazio region of central Italy. Because that's where Chef Aldo is from. Chef Aldo is from a small town outside of Rome in the Lazio region of central Italy. So we pay homage to him in this menu. That uh, the Pagliafiano uh, uh, Molavecchia that's on your menu, like the old world Pagliafiano as it's called. That's a dish that I ate when I was in uh, Reggio Emilia. So Emilia Romagna is like the, the, the area of Italy is broken down into different categories, different uh, regions. Up in the north, uh, more of like the northern region is where uh, Reggio Emilia is, the region of Italy. And I consider that to be the food mecca of Italy. Because inside the area of Emilia Romagna are three very influential food cities Parma, Modena, and Reggio Emilia. Parma, we already talked about what Parma, Italy, is famous for prosciutto. Reggio Emilia is a, set, a city that's located right in between Modena and Parma. What comes from Modena, Italy? 